All right, so we're continuing our discussion of stress today, focusing it on PTSD and compassion fatigue, uh, which are both really good pa paths to depression and suicide. Um, so kind of one of the things that a lot of times we, we discuss with this topic is, you know, we uh, only have so much that we can hold before, you know, our, our emotions overflow. So we like to think of, you know, our ability to, to deal with stress as being like a glass and the glass can only hold so much water before it overflows and spills out and so that is you know where stress goes for us too that we can only hold so much so ptsd um we don't really know what causes ptsd per se and we might be familiar with some other terminologies for ptsd you know back in world war ii and korean war they called it shell shock um, a couple other different terminologies that were used for folks who would go to war come home and they would have changed and it was basically just attributed to you know war changed them that they the battle got to them um, so we don't really know because folks get ptsd even if they don't go into the military police officers get it firefighters get it emts get it we have a lot of different folks who will get ptsd um, even just general civilians you can get ptsd uh, from something as simple as you know your mom or dad uh, being in a car crash and you're in the car and, and they die and you don't. So that can trigger PTSD. It can be from one event or it can be from multiple events. So it could be one, you know, life-threatening thing that has that just got you. Uh, or it could be, you know, just a series of events that, get just they overflow you. We don't know. Some people seem to be able to handle things and, and you know, deal with them. And some people uh, cannot. So some of the symptoms, folks who have PTSD, nightmares, flashbacks, you know, that, that they keep reliving uh, the, the events that, that are triggering their PTSD, uh, the, some anger issues, rage, uncontrollable irritability, they get into, you know, depression, sadness, they lose their self-esteem, begin to distrust other people, they can only trust one person, and that's themselves, guilt, especially when you talk about like survivor's guilt, where somebody... I was involved in a traumatic situation. Somebody that they were with uh, just died. And now they're alive and they're guilty that they weren't the one who died or that they didn't die along with the other person. Um, they might have isolation, part of our distrust and guilt. They might isolate so that other folks don't get hurt. Um, going along with that, you know, nightmares and flashbacks, we could have fixation on memories where, where folks just keep, you know, replaying that what if I, I coulda, shoulda, woulda, you know, done it differently this would have turned out, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and then also the manifestation of new phobias. Somebody might not have previously been afraid of something, and now they try to avoid certain types of things. They, they, they seem to be afraid of something. Not saying that they're afraid to do their job as a police officer, just saying that, that at one point in time they had no problem with heights, and now suddenly they're afraid of heights. Uh, or at one point in time they had no problem dealing with a certain kind of call, and now suddenly they, you know, when that kind of call comes in, they're like, no, you, somebody else needs to take this. Some of the treatments we have. Well, prevention is one of the big ones. Uh, unfortunately, we can't prevent ourselves from going to traumatic calls, so that uh, that's not possible. But, you know, doing critical incident stress debriefings post-traumatic calls can assist with our um, overflowing of that cup. So if we can get some of these uh, critical incident stress debriefings going on, now we can mitigate a little bit. It's not going to be 100% always, but we can mitigate the, the likelihood of uh, a PTSD uh, situation coming up. Folks who develop PTSD, there are plenty of therapies that are uh, work and help people with their symptoms. Uh, some of the therapies deal with actually going in you know, and, and doing some stuff with a therapist. So the therapies are at home, but there's a number of different kinds of therapies that can be done. Medication with some of our severe depression, getting on an antidepressant, getting on an anti-anxiety medication, nothing wrong with that when needed um, properly. And then also counseling, some of our group counseling, so, you know, getting together uh, with other peers who have PTSD, who've been involved in similar high stress traumatic situations, and finding out that other people are feeling the same way and that your feelings are actually natural and normal because uh, a lot of people will have denial with PTSD where they say, you know, there's something wrong with me feeling this way, not realizing that everybody else they work with is feeling the exact same way. 
Another thing that we experience in law enforcement that um, sometimes folks call PTSD or blame as PTSD, but it's actually something a little bit different. You know, so PTSD commonly is, is like an event or a, a culmination of a bunch of events. In addition to traumatic events, what we can have is this emotional exhaustion, which is coupled with a physical exhaustion caused by caring for victims. Um, so we're dealing with people who are suffering. People don't call 911 on a happy day. They're calling 911 because they've had stuff stolen from them. They're in car crashes. They're involved in a neighbor dispute. They're, they're just unhappy about whatever the case may be um, that, that, that they think the police need to help their problem. So day in and day out, we're talking to people who are expressing their problems. They're expressing their, their, their negativity, and we're just getting all this negativity in. Eventually, we burn out. Um, there's a little bit more to compassion fatigue than just being, quote, unquote, burnt out. Because quite frankly, you know, you, you could have a long haul where you work a bunch of overtime and feel burnt out because you're having a day off. You take, you know, a day off, you get a good night's sleep, and boom, you're feeling good. So burnout is a step towards compassion fatigue. And, uh, you know, they, they sometimes can go hand in hand. Uh, but keep in mind that there's traumas and other things that happen um, to take a burnout to that next level. Some of our symptoms, we're bott bottling up our emotions. You know, we're police officers and everything, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Uh, so trying to, to, you know, allow ourselves that, that point when you're, you're pissed off. Let somebody know you're pissed off. Uh, not the public, you know, maybe a coworker. Uh, when you go home and you're unhappy, say I'm unhappy. Uh, you know, when, 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 when something is not of interest to you, say I'm I, I don't care. I don't don't want to do that. Uh, but but not keeping everything bottled up. Sometimes with compassion fatigue, we start isolating ourselves. You know, well, I don't want to deal with drama. You know that, that that you're dealing with with drama and stuff at at work, and then you go home and your spouse, significant other, starts talking about you know some sort of drama or something uh, going on at, at school uh, or at work. Uh, you go talk to your neighbors and they're talking about drama at their work and you're just like, I'm, I'm done. I just, just leave me alone. I want to sit in a dark room all by myself and, you know, play video games and drink beer. So isolation, um, increase in complaints that sometimes people with compassion fatigue, they, they stop caring. And as such, they become jerks, they become cynics. And then that's when com complaints start coming in that, that a citizen will be like, you know, this guy was kind of a jerk to me. You know, yeah, I deserved the ticket, but, you know, he didn't have to be so mean giving me the ticket. We also start people, start, start stopping. They start, they begin to stop caring about their personal hygiene. This is where you get these officers who they wear the same uniform day in and day out. I mean, you can actually see the ketchup stain from lunch yesterday uh, or from lunch last week still on their shirt. They haven't even taken, they haven't washed it. You know, they're not getting haircuts. Their hair's getting all nasty. They, they only shave when the sergeant says, dude, you're, your beard's getting scruffy. You need to shave because we have a no facial hair policy. Their hygiene just gets goes bad. You know, even deodorant. I, trust me, you, sometimes you'll work with that stinky cop. You'll know what I'm talking about. Chronic ailments. Um, you know, gastrointestinal. They're not that. You know, food doesn't digest for them. They're having problems going to the bathroom. Um, colds that will not go away. Sinuses. I mean, some of us. I I have sinus issues. I always have, but. You know, when the chronic issues become super chronic, where it's actually like missing work and things like that. Um, when they just get apathetic, they, you know, again, they stop caring. They're like, eh, whatever. Um, and they used to be a caring person. And now they're just, you know, that, that, that jerk, that cynic. Uh, when, when there are issues and it's always somebody else's fault, you know, uh, officer you know, trips, falls, whatever. And, and suddenly they're, they're going to blame somebody else for putting something in their way to trip them. And it's like, dude, nobody put something in your way. You're clumsy. We, 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 we all have days where we trip and fall, but of course we have to blame other people. Um, and oftentimes it's going to be supervisors, uh, administration, everything, everything is the problem of some policy coming down when in reality, you know, sometimes we make our own bed. Sometimes we make the decision to do something stupid and that gets us in trouble. Um, and sometimes policies come down for a reason. And then you also start seeing with some of the compassion fatigue because they're not feeling they want to feel. So then we get compulsive behaviors, start gambling, start, uh, going and having affairs, you know, having having uh, unsafe sexual type relationships, 
um, getting into alcohol, self-medication, those kinds of compulsive behaviors where this person normally wouldn't do this kind of stuff and suddenly now they are because they are trying to get back some feelings that they have lost. Treatment for the compassion fatigue. Good stress relief, you know. Burn off your stress and uh, you should be able to maintain your compassion. Um, you know, you got to have fun. Go on vacation. Get away from work every so often. Take those days off. Do what needs to be done so that you don't burn out. Say no when, when you're offered overtime or something. And if you don't need the money, say no, I don't, I don't need the money. Um, you know, people keep asking. If you're known as the go-to person who never says no, sometimes you got to say no. Find your friends outside of police work. If all we're doing is dealing with cops, everything. When we get away from work, people, we're, 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 we're complaining now about stuff. We're complaining about calls. We're complaining about the administration. Everything is now about the job, and the job starts us into the burnout. Get active in your community. You know, go coach the Little League team. Do something. If you're into church, become active in your church. If you're into, you know, a, 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 I don't know, whatever, get, get, get active in whatever. If you're if you're into music, join a band, you know, a local community band or theater or something. But get active in your community and be involved so that you are doing stuff other than your police officer job. Um, find your healthy support system also. Typically, it's your family, uh, but you can't alienate your family. you got to be good for your family. you got to make sure that they understand some of the police work stuff. So, you know, I was talking about that, that um, Emotional Survival for Police Work book, which is the, the book for this, this class. Um, there's some other books out there for police families. You know, get some of these books so that they understand what you're going through and so that they understand how when you come home and say, I don't know what I want for dinner, that they don't sit there and berate you for not knowing what you want for dinner and they just make something uh, or have that meal plan ahead of time. When somebody says to you, Hey, uh, you, are you okay? And you're not okay. Say, you know, I'm feeling a little sad. I'm feeling I'm a little pissed off. Let people offer you help and accept that help when it's taken. Uh, and, and you also have to accept where you're at. If you're stressed, you have to accept the fact that you're stressed and you have to accept the fact that we get stressed and we get pissed off and you're going to have days where you're going to make progress towards not getting into compassion fatigue and you're going to have days where you're you know going to be pushed back, where it seems like everything goes wrong. Accept that. Be okay with it. Because you know what? There is help. There is hope. And quite frankly, you know, we could list off a number of the different uh, groups out there that will help you. Uh, I actually have a pamphlet here from the DOJ that is on compassion fatigue. And on the back is a number of resources, websites, and phone numbers that we should have available to us. And at your police department, you'll have a number of these. So, you know, you've got Cops Alive, uh, the Compassion Fatigue um, Awareness Project, Badge of Lice, Badge of Life, not Lice, Life, um, the Green Cross Foundation. There's a number of these uh, gr groups out there. Uh, the, the Cop Helpline, Cop to Cop, to cop Helpline, uh, where, you know, you can, you can get help uh, if you need it, or you can at least, um, you know, talk to somebody about what you're feeling. But, you know, folks, not everything in our job is bad. Don't focus and dwell on the bad stuff. Tell the funny stories about the day, you know, there was a uh, comic book convention in town, and so you went and took some funny pictures with some stormtroopers. You know, do the Halloween stuff. You know, when you get invited to the schools, go into the schools, do that. Shop with a cop is a great thing at the holidays. Going around with, with disadvantaged uh, families, kids who might have negative feelings about police, and buying them Christmas presents, uh, you know, Silly stuff like dressing the canine up, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of good that we do. There's a lot of funny stuff we do. Focus on the good. Focus on the funny. You know, when, when folks ask you to tell you tell a story about being a cop, tell them about arresting a stormtrooper. Tell them about having Monsters Incorporated sitting in the Frontier Squad car. Don't tell them about that car crash where the three high schoolers died because that might be the gory story that they might be wanting, but you don't need to be reliving that in your mind because that's going to push you down that dark path. All right, so we're pushing in close to the 15-minute uh, time limit for the recording software here. If anybody has any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will see you in class for our next workout.